From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Thirty minutes into the U.S. trading day, it's Monday, July 11th. Here are the top market moving stories we're following for you this hour. King Dollar, the greenback, is continuing to gain ground ahead of the U.S. earnings season, which kicks off this week. Chip aid, U.S. lawmakers try to hash out a deal to subsidize the chip industry. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo joins us later this hour to discuss how, why this has to pass now. And Nord Stream halt, the gas pipeline to Germany shuts down for maintenance. What that means for Europe's energy supply at a crucial moment. From New York, I'm Katie Greifeld with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, I see stock slipping. I see the dollar surging. Seems pretty risk off to start this week. Yeah, the dollar story, I think, is absolutely front and centre here, Katie. Uh, where are we trading now? Well, basically one for one. Let's call it that. A little bit of a blip in the last few minutes to the upside for the euro. But nevertheless, a huge move over the last few weeks to the downside. Is this dollar strength or is this euro weakness? I think there's probably a little bit of both in the mix here. But we've got a big week coming up, haven't we? US CPI is going to be on Wednesday. We've obviously got the ongoing saga surrounding what is happening with European gas. We've got UMISH coming up on Friday. Plenty of opportunities uh, for either side of this pair to show some significant movement. So let's talk about our question of the day. Where does the buck stop? That is our question. We asked, asked this question a few weeks back. We thought we had the answer, but it turns out we didn't. Christine Aquino joins us from New York, Bloomberg Markets Editor, and Gina Martin-Adams, Chief Equity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, joining me here in London, which is a nice surprise. Uh, I'm going to start with Christine over in New York. Christine, where does the buck stop? And is this euro strength or is this dollar, uh, sorry, is this euro weakness or dollar strength? Well, Guy, I think you're absolutely right in saying that it is a little bit of both in terms of the dollar trajectory here, because, of course, the euro weakness that we're seeing right now is very much a big part of that, especially because there is a very Europe-specific reason as to why the euro is weakening. This is, of course, the deterioration in fundamentals in the euro area, as well as renewed risks from its exposure to the Russia conflict, which is still ongoing, the latest of that being that the threat of Russia cutting off its gas supply to Europe is suddenly becoming quite real at this point and it's very much a euro negative story. But then of course on the flip side there are also very specific dollar positive factors here. Of course very importantly what the Federal Reserve is doing and what they're preparing to do we have heard from several policymakers again flagging the possibility of a 75 basis point rate hike as soon as next month or in the next couple of months and that is very much powering the dollar higher. Where does the buck stop? I think parity is is actually quite conservative. It's probably looking more beyond that and more your weakness to come in dollar strength on the flip side. Well, Christine set us up nicely. The dollar powering higher. Gina, let's wrap that into what we're going to get this week with the big banks kicking off earnings stateside. There was an interesting note from Morgan Stanley over the weekend saying that if you look at the 16% climb in the ICE dollar index, that's about an 8% headwind for S&P 500 EPS growth. Does that sound right to you? Is it that dramatic? It depends upon really the combination of the dollar and the economic outlook, Katie. I think when we think about the dollar, typically the dollar is surging in periods of economic weakness or risk off periods. That's exactly what's been happening over the course of this year as we've been decre decreasing our expectation for growth at the same time that the dollar is rising. So the net result is slower earnings growth. Analysts have shown some tendency to reduce expectations in particular for the more multinational and growth sensitive segments of the index, which may be related to the dollar. But I think it's really difficult to isolate one versus the other. It's the combination that's most meaningful and the result is expectations for second quarter earnings growth have come in from close to 7% earnings growth just at the end of April to closer to 4% earnings growth now. And the biggest drag there is, again, growth, where growth earnings are actually expected to decline year over year. If I listen to the calls this week, if I listen to the calls next week, um, how many times am I going to hear the dollar mentioned? I, Microsoft's yeah. already warned. Yep. 
Is it going to be a big feature of the landscape in terms yeah. of the language used, do you think? I think it will be for the one-third of companies that actually has exposure. Yep. But I do think you want to keep in mind that that's one-third of the S&P 500. So 65% of companies are actually net beneficiaries of the dollar. When the dollar rises, generally their earnings are positively correlated. But for the 35% that experience some negative result as a result of the dollar rising, you will hear it. Many of them are the big supposed bellwethers. So yeah. that's why when Microsoft made the announcement it had such a big impact is the presumption is if it's impacting Microsoft, it's impacting the entire software space. And you'll hear the same with the hardware companies that announce, with the Staples companies that announce. We've already heard a bit of Staples weakness to start to emerge. So you will hear it. It will be a big story for that one third. Okay, Christine. So according to Gina, about a third of companies have an excuse here. But what are the risks or the possibility that we see some companies try to use this dollar strength almost as a scapegoat? Well, it's very much a possibility, Katie, for sure. And like Gina said, it's probably about a third that has this as a valid reason for any sort of earning weakness that comes through. But then for the rest of it, it might be an excuse. But I do wonder just the effect of that in and of itself. You know, a number of companies, particularly bellwether companies, blue chip companies such as Microsoft, suddenly talking about the dollar's impact on their earnings. I mean, we did some analysis on this a couple of months ago. And even in the past earnings season, it was quite a number of companies saying or citing dollar strength as a reason for earnings weakness. We've never really seen that before, at least not in this sort of environment where the Fed is, of course, simultaneously talking about multiple supersized rate hikes. And so it is a very unique environment in a lot of ways. And so even that, the idea that a lot of companies now more than ever are talking about the dollar impact on their earnings, is that something that would deliver that kind of uh, ripple effect in terms of sentiment? across markets. You, have, you do really have to wonder. Gina, how extreme is, is this position at this point? Mm -hmm. When we think about history, could we go much further? The euro has been weakness, yeah. weaker than this. So wh the last time the euro was, was even weaker than this down in the 80s, what did the picture look like? Yeah. I, I suspect the, the overlay on growth was probably a little bit different. But nevertheless, yeah. it's, it's worth trying to get a bit of historical perspective. Yeah. So it's worth looking at on a year-over-year -year basis, how big is the dollar gain? And when we look over the last 20 years, we find actually 21 instances in which the dollar has gained more on a year-over-year -year basis than it has already over the last year. But that's oh. 21 monthly instances over a very long period of time. So it's relatively consequential. At this point in time, a 1% gain in the dollar has about a 17 basis point drag on S&P 500 EPS. Long-term history, the dollar and EPS have no relationship. So that tells you it's enough that it's actually dragging EPS lower. But over a long period of time, dollar gains are inconsequential to EPS. So you do the math. We're looking at 17 yep. basis points off of growth for every 1% gain. You've got a double-digit gain in the dollar. Those, those moves are starting to really add up. And the greater the strength, the greater the drag it ultimately has. And if I look quickly at EURUSD, we are about a breath away from parity right now. And Christine, I like what you said that Parity is conservative, that we could see a big move to the downside from there, at least pairwise. What sort of levels are you hearing when you talk to strategists and investors? Well, we've certainly seen the level 95 being flagged around, but I think now that we're kind of here, because this, this whole parity idea was actually something that came about even earlier in the year before we really got to these levels. And so as the case with markets, as the case with a lot of strategists, now that we're kind of getting close to that yep. level, it's up to them to up the ante, right? And so we are hearing uh, closer to the 90s for sure. And I think what's fun fundamental here is really the extent of your weakness that people are expecting in the markets and also the length of time that it's, it's going to stay there. And I think really the direction of travel, regardless of the specific levels that people are pointing to, it really is much, much lower from here and for a prolonged amount yep. of time. Um, Christine, I think we had Kit Jukes on the other day from Sokgen saying if the Russians cut the gas off, we definitely go down to 90 or potentially even lower than that. So. Maybe this is a gas trade as much as anything else. That's the euro side. But let's talk about the dollar side of the equation here. Does the dollar run out of road when U.S. inflation peaks? And could that be this Wednesday? 
I mean, it really ha will have to depend on the response of the Federal Reserve guy. And, you know, just from what we've heard from them recently, though, it doesn't seem like one data point is going to stop them from this particular cycle because they also have that other mandate, which is, of course, full employment. And the jobs report from Friday, if anything, really just strengthens the conviction that they do have to deliver multiple uh, multiples of these supersized rate hikes to the market because it's not just inflation that's factoring into that decision. And so I think whether, you know, some semblance of a peak comes as soon as this Wednesday is probably not going to be so relevant to the longer term decision making of the Fed, because it really sounds like they have set themselves up for a path of a multiple uh, supersized rate hikes, at least for the next couple of meetings. All right, Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence and Bloomberg's Christine Aquino. Thank you both so much. Great chat to start off the week. And coming up, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, just one of several warning that dollar strength will hit earnings. We're going to discuss where the buck stops with Victoria Green, G Squared Private Wealth CIO. This is Bloomberg. season is coming. It's a low bar going into earn exceeds. There are bargains out there to be had. Bloomberg is fastest with the numbers and analysis. It's conflicting and complex cross currents. Strap yourself in for this earnings season. Bloomberg, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Uh, I would be very, very surprised if we went into a new bull market anytime soon. And we've just been through the most speculative period in our financial history. You know, SPACs, uh, 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 would-be, you know, um, FANGs, yeah. uh, zero commissions, zero yeah. interest rates. That was the Mega Advisors chairman and CEO, Leon Cooperman, earlier on Bloomberg Television. And sticking with the bulls and the bears, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley out with a note warning that the surge in the dollar will be a massive headwind for profits at many U.S. companies. It's another reason to expect a dimming earnings outlook, which takes us back to our question of the day, where does the buck stop? Let's ask Victoria Green, G Squared <laughs> Private Wealth CIO. Victoria, great to have you with us. How much juice is left in this dollar move, and what does that mean for corporate America? It's not good. It typically is a big earnings drag. It's important to know where your company's revenues are coming from and, and how this may affect the currency translation. But look, right now you have a Fed that's that's going to hike aggressively. They got a green light to go with a good unemployment. You know, we're all watching Wednesday. We'll see what happens with inflation. But right now you kind of have disparity across the world with what the U.S. economy is doing and what's happening in, say, Europe and Japan. And some of that I even put into kind of the commodity makers and the commodity takers, right? So we we have companies that are producing oil and gas and then a lot of pressure on Europe on, on how they're going to be able to consume and get their oil and gas. So I think the dollar could continue to run. Obviously, it's data dependent um, and it's going to be a bit, big headwind because you, this is a fairly rapid rise in Q2. And, you know, like you said, companies may try to bail out weak earnings anyway and blame the dollar. It's kind of fun. It's like blaming the hedge funds for shorting you if you're not doing well in the market. Victoria. Let's talk more broadly about stocks. Still bearish? Yes, I think this is more of a dead cat bounce. Um, we'll see what happens Wednesday in earnings season. We are bearish on earnings. You know, not to, you know, winter is coming as kind of our theme here, uh, because I don't think the numbers are going to be great. If you look at the inflationary pressures, the labor pressures, not much happened from Q1. And expectations in this year was that Q2 was going to be the hardest hit earnings. Uh, and, and we might see a second half recovery. So I think we, we have a lot of headwinds. And then you throw in the dollar on top of all of these other things that companies were facing, uh, and then some commodity price uncertainty. Yes, we saw some input prices come down late June, for, but for the bulk of Q2, you still saw a lot of high inflationary pressures from metals and oil and gas. So I think it's going to depend on how successful CEOs were navigating, how much contracting and hedging they had, and, and, and what they're able to to say going forward, you know, guidance is something that we're listening to very carefully. It's almost like data is moving so fast. We're like, oh, we expected a bad Q2. 
two, but what about the second half of the year? You know, so I, I think earnings misses are going to be punished. I think if you beat, you're not necessarily going to be rewarded as much. And we saw some of that in Q1, mm. where a good EPS beat, but maybe a margin miss, then you were punished. And or a good beat and a good margin, but your guidance was was slowing, you still got punished. So it's almost like companies can't win right now because of all the worry. Companies can't win, but when you look across sort of the landscape here, which sectors and industries stand out to you right now as most vulnerable as we look ahead to earnings season? Um, you know, I think you've got the, some of this discretionary, obviously the consumers had a lot of stress. I know they're, they're starting to add on some debt and, and go into their credit cards to keep spending a little bit higher, but I think discretionary could certainly be under pressure staples. If you saw some increase in costs, but you know, Costco actually came out, uh, which is a stock we really like saying, Hey, we actually had a pretty decent Q2 on, on some of our gasoline revenues and other things. So I, I think you need to think consumer exposed stocks. And then also the technology sector is one, especially the the growthy sector or small cap sector where they're just more aggressive and more levered. We want stocks with show me earnings, right? Show me cash flow now. Uh, we want a shower. Yep. We don't want one that we're, we're, we're getting promised things in the future that are future growers and, and oh, we're going to make you money in the future. We've got all of this innovation. We want stocks that right now show me you make money and you can execute in a tough market. Are the oil stocks will still within that group? Brent, WTI all over the place. Uh, Brent's down 2% today, 104, but we've been sub 400, sub 100. We've been uh, up into the kind of mid 150 area. Victoria, this is an area that's all over the place as the tr market tries to figure out where the global economy is going. What impact is that having on your thoughts around oil stocks? We still like energy stocks. You did notice I left them off my list a little bit earlier. We're a little more neutral short term. You have this battle right now between supply constraints and what's happening in Russia. Uh, and then you have demand, potential demand destruction with a recession, which historically isn't great. And there are some ugly charts right now, a lot of comparisons about the 2008. Uh, you know, you had the spike in prices up to 150 and then it immediately came down after we hit a major recession. We don't necessarily think that's going to happen. If you look at what oil was doing pre-Russia, you're already at that $90 a barrel level, which is a great spot for a lot of U.S. producers, especially in the Permian where their break-evens are much, much lower. Um, so I think you could have some near-term headwinds. I think they're going to have a great Q2. Uh, you still have them print cash. You haven't seen a ton of CapEx. They're distributing their, their earnings and cash flow to their shareholders. Um, and so I think you've got a little wild cards and we're a little, little worried about what the trajectory is going to be short-term. And some of that has to do with is Russia going to come off all natural gas to, to Europe, um, which could cause a, a massive price. And you look around and you had what JP Morgan at 380 as a, as a, a tail end risk if, if Russia fully exits Europe. And then you have, you know, 65 from Citi. So you have this wide dispersion and it's just going to be data dependent. Um, we tend to think it's going to be a mild recession. So we, we are holding tight with our oil and gas. We'll, we'll clip our dividends. We're getting paid to wait there right now for most of these companies and paid very handsomely. And we tend to think that 90 to 100 dollar oil is very sustainable we didn't like oil over 100 that's where all of a sudden yep. you see this demand destruction yeah you certainly do everybody complaining about what's happening when it comes to gasoline we're going to talk about that a little bit later on the show victoria thank you very much indeed victoria green of g squared private wealth great stuff still ahead wall street very much focusing on what is happening surrounding the bitcoin story trying to work out where we go from here uh, is Bitcoin's crash a lot to get a uh, about to get a whole lot worse? We're going to bring you the details from our Bloomberg M Life Pulse survey next. This is Bloomberg. In a Bloomberg survey of 950 investors, about 60% say that Bitcoin is more likely to fall back to 10,000 than it is to go back to 30,000. Here's what our TV guest had to say. We are in a crypto winter, so again, that could be an area where you dabble. You know, I wouldn't necessarily allocate large chunks of my portfolio to it, but I am comfortable taking, you know, smaller positions. The volatility is excessive. It's very, it's volatility like currencies. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it can find a place in that portfolio. 
uh, notwithstanding, you know, what I've said, it's very difficult to predict. We struggle to find a valuation model. How do you value Bitcoin or the other currency? So we have always advised our clients or investors to tread carefully. It is very much a risk asset rather than a store of value. And it is, in some sense, a bet on a business model that is very much yet to be Proven. My suspicion is, is that this is here to stay, and uh, I think that, uh, as I said, you know, you, you, you write off the mass movement of these, you know, super talented, super ambitious people at our peril. Joining us now is Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Isabel Lee. And Isabel, looking through the results of this survey, seems like the read was pretty bearish. It was bearish, but it's not that big of a difference. It's 60 percent of the uh, respondents in the survey think that Bitcoin will hit 10K first over the 40% who thinks Bitcoin will hit 40K first, 30K rather. But the sentiment is indeed bearish. I mean, I, I don't blame the investors with everything happening from the collapse of Terra Luna and other currencies. And a lot of these crypto lenders are also just imploding from Voyager and digital. So the sentiment is like that. But I checked um, the Bitcoin price before coming on TV. And earlier in June, Bitcoin was around 29K. But then in the past 30 days, Bitcoin was just ranging from 19 to 21. So it's a tight range and it's not the Bitcoin or the crypto that we know, because usually cryptocurrencies are volatile, but now they're kind of stable. Bitcoin crypto has been almost religious in terms of the way that people have approached it. Um, but now you've got institutional investors in who in theory should come in Isabel and Adam's got a more pragmatic approach to what is happening here. Are we seeing significant differences between retail and, and what's happening on the institutional front? So institutional investors are less apprehensive in investing in cryptocurrencies, which I kind of understand because you hear a lot of stories of retail traders putting in significant chunks of their life savings or even their entire life savings in digital assets. And they got burned because now cryptocurrencies are really just in the doldrums. Um, but also one would argue that maybe uh, institutional investors, maybe they have a bit more cushion. But if you also look at the survey more closely, it's not that big of a difference as well. And even then, each, for example, retail investors, 24% of them think that cryptocurrencies are garbage, but 23% of them think that it's the future. So it's still kind of polarizing within the trader group and also outside of the trader group. So it's still a space that I think has a lot of development and maturing to do. And Isabel, before we let you go, just quickly, we're talking about crypto broadly here, but what was the breakdown between the different coins? There wasn't a lot of details in altcoins, but then in general, sometimes altcoins in the past few days have outperformed cryptocurrencies. Um, most of the time that happens, sometimes that happens, most of the time altcoins move in lockstep with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is still dominant coin. It's still the largest in terms of market cap. It's the most famous, it's the most established. So it's still the leader by far. Isabel, really interesting survey. Thank you very much indeed for bringing us the details. Bloomberg's Isabel Lee. Uh, and tune in, of course, to Bloomberg Crypto. Matt Miller, Kayleigh Lines, 1 p.m. New York time. All happens on Tuesdays. Coming up, uh, President Biden visiting the Middle East this week. We're going to talk about what to expect. Uh, we are going to be joined by Terry Haynes, Pangea Policy Founder. That conversation is coming up next. Uh, we've got Israel first, then obviously the main event, Saudi Arabia. That is where we're going to be focusing our attention next. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into the U.S. trading session. Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle, Doolittle is tracking the move and joins us now. Well, Katie, a bit of a rough session here. You can see the S&P 500 down 1.2%. The tech-heavy Nasdaq down even more, down 2%. This, of course, after last week's big rally, those buyers not here. I would point out, though, it's very thin trading. The last time I looked at volume, 25% below the average. And it's interesting also because yields down typically would help out stocks, technology in particular, as valuations would be more attractive. But today, with stocks down and yields down, it suggests that there's some haven buying 
for bonds. So true risk off day added to you by the fact that you have that VIX just a little bit higher, but still well below 30. As for one pressure on stocks, it could certainly be uh, the dollar. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley is saying that he thinks that we could see some more weakness ahead for stocks in line with his bearish call this year as the dollar climbs. In fact, the Bloomberg dollar index here in blue, it is at its highest level of the pandemic, and you can really see the inverse relationship. This, of course, one help, though, relative to commodities because oil is back down lower today as the dollar surges. And a big piece of that, of course, uh, euro weakness. As for another area of weakness, that's China Tech. Over the weekend, that COVID zero policy, more COVID outbreaks, the uh, lockdown in Macau, that has technology sh shares. The Golden Dragon Index uh, down 6.9% overall for this space. The worst day in more than two months. Of course, it comes on the back of a 50% rally on the year. So some profit taking here. Let's see which way it plays out. And then finally, some names moving here in the U.S. The big one, the big story stock of the day, the week, uh, the year. Twitter right now down about 7% at 3427. This, of course, is Elon Musk has walked away from his $44 billion bid. The question is, of course, there's uh, likely big time legal action ahead. The question could be, though, is he going to try to bid for this company at a lower price? Many have suggested that all along, that that could be a piece of what's going on. Lululemon down 3.7 percent as Jefferies has cut the stock uh, along with Under Armour to uh, an underperform, saying that some of the uh, demand in this space was pulled forward by the pandemic go best in class. That's Nike, according to Jefferies. Wind Resorts on that China lockdown, uh, the Macau lockdown for a week down 7.8 percent. Uh, a good chunk of their revenue comes from the Macau region. And then finally, Bitcoin guy can't get out of its own way. It is still above $20,000 per Bitcoin, but the weakness that we're seeing today, it is dragging on all of those crypto stocks and Marathon Digital Holdings, no exception, down 4.5%. Makes you wonder where they'd be if we get to 10, as we've just been discussing. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Abigail Doolittle on what's happening in the markets. Let's talk about what's going to be happening in the rest of the week. Uh, President Biden leaving Tuesday for his trip to the Middle East. He's hoping for higher oil production from Gulf allies. Is he going to get it? Joining us for more, Terry Haynes, Pangea policy founder. Terry, great to chat ahead of this trip. What would be a win for the president and how high would you rate his chances of getting such a win? Uh, good morning, Guy. Uh, I, you know, what this trip to me is about is about real politic and about engagement. And if what we see coming out of this meeting uh, between the president and the regent, Mohammed bin Salman, is a, a closer alliance on Middle East security, uh, where the United States and Saudi are going to be jointly pushing. Uh, you know, that's yeah. a plus. Uh, if they work uh, jointly with Israel, that's still a bigger plus. And judging by the president's itinerary, that's more than likely what's going to happen. So, so, Terry, just to, just to jump in here, what you're saying is that this trip is not about oil. Oh, I'm, I'm saying this is very much not about oil uh, the, the, for a couple of reasons. So one is, of course, OPEC has decided, OPEC makes the decisions on pumping overall. OPEC has already, at the Saudis' behest, uh, increased pumping slightly, uh, something that was seen as both kind of a welcome mat for Biden and a pushback at the Russians a bit. Uh, so the benefit on oil that uh, the United States and the president gets out of this has already happened. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of uh, political uh, consequences here immediately. Uh, the president takes a double hit. He takes a, a human rights hit from his progressives. And at the same time, for kind of middle America, middle class, uh, takes a hit on oil prices because the line will be, well, you know, Biden went cap in hand to the Saudis and came up with nothing, which, as I say, isn't strictly really true. But uh, that's the, the, that's actually what uh, will come away from it. But, the, uh, but, but this is much more about Middle Eastern security, and, uh, and trying to shore things up in advance of a possible new Iran deal, uh, pushing back at Russia's uh, pretensions to a sphere of influence in the region, uh, dealing with the Chinese uh, economic interests, and again, uh, you know, trying to forge common cause with Israel here. And so, Terry, if President Biden is going to take a hit from the human rights side, if he's going to take a hit on this not being necessarily about lowering prices at the pump, what would a win look like for this administration in the court of U.S. public opinion? Uh, that will be very difficult to come up with in the court of U.S. public opinion, Katie. I think that's a, an excellent point. Uh, but the 
the Middle Eastern security uh, needs here and the need for the United States to work in concert with people throughout the, in countries throughout the Middle East, not just one or another or anything else, uh, are really uh, are really outweighing uh, the need to get something dramatic done on oil, which, as I say, isn't really possible anyway, and, uh, and clearly outweighs uh, the, the concerns of part of his party who would prefer that he prioritize nothing but human rights issues here. And so, Terry, a lot of focus has been paid to the Saudi Arabia leg of this trip, but Biden also said to travel to Israel. How does that fit into the broader picture of what the administration is trying to accomplish here? Well, what they're really trying to do is, is forge an all Middle East solution. Uh, you know, historically, uh, there have been a lot of factions within uh, what generally gets loosely called the Arab world, uh, and, and a lot of tensions, of course, and, and, and sometimes more, uh, between the Arab, the Arab factions and Israel. Uh, and what Biden's trying to do, frankly, is build on the progress of the past few years and come up with an all-Middle Eastern solution uh, that provides an effective counterweight to Iranian, uh, Iranian pretensions in the region as well. Uh, and whether or not the administration gets an Iranian nuclear deal uh, done again, uh, that's going to be an, a very important counter uh, to Iran. So uh, this is about uh, Middle Eastern security and then uh, more broadly world security. Yep. And thus it's a very important meeting. Terry, CPI, inflation data Wednesday. Before the president goes to the Middle East, do you think there's any chance he announces some sort of easing of tariffs with China? Uh, I think that's uh, that's certainly possible, uh, but uh, markets should not think that they're going to be large or consequential. The administration has been signaling uh, that as much uh, in the press for the past week or two, uh, uh, number one. Number two, uh, they've been fooling around with the, the whole tariff issue for going on a year and a half here. So markets should not look for anything consequential, number one. Number two, even any small uh, adjustment in tariffs doesn't have either an immediate or a real long-term impact, uh, and it also is not going to change the, uh, the, the, the difficult trajectory that United States-China relations are already on. And Terry, let's talk about the elephant in the room, of course, Russia. What message is the administration trying to send to Russia with this trip, in addition to trying to shore up stability, as you've talked about? Oh, really two things, Katie. One is that, uh, as I say, Russia has had pretensions for quite some time, and, and the, the Russian pretensions go back, you know, all the way back to the kind of great game in the 19th and early 20th century, predating the Soviet Union, uh, about a sphere of influence in the Middle East. And that's in part what uh, the, the Syrian incursion is about. And the previous administration uh, allowed that to happen, uh, firstly. Uh, secondly, what it's you can tell a lot about what the administration is up to from the conversations that Secretary of State Blinken and the Chinese Foreign Minister had in a sidebar at the G20 Foreign Ministers meetings uh, recently. And uh, uh, Blinken's readout of this was that uh, the United States is really pushing hard on China uh, to get off the neutral, the so-called neutral foot on Russia and put some more pressure on Russia. Uh, I don't think China's inclined to do that, certainly on, whether under pressure from Secretary Blinken or not. Uh, but the administration has made it very clear that uh, that China needs to join in to, uh, to kind of complete the encirclement of Russia uh, in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. and, and push for a solution to the Ira Ukrainian matter uh, that is more favorable than it might be today. Terry Haynes, Pangea Policy Founder, thank you so much for your time. And don't miss our exclusive interview with U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo at 11.30 a.m. New York time, 4.30 p.m. London. And coming up, Twitter slumps after Elon Musk's about face on buying the company. Twitter and Elon Musk are about to go to court. We'll talk with Angelo Zeno, who covers Twitter at CFRA. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishke Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Robert Hallmatt, the Tiedemann Advisors Managing Director and former Goldman Sachs Vice Chairman, joining Bloomberg Television, noon New York time. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. Here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. Nearly two-thirds of Democratic voters say they would prefer someone other than President Biden as their party's candidate in the 2024 election. That is according to a poll by The New York Times and Siena College. A third of those who want to change cited job performance. Another third cited the president's age. Joe Biden is 79, the oldest president in U.S. history. The latest COVID outbreak in Shanghai is getting larger. The city recorded 69 new infections on Sunday, the most since late May. There will be more mass testing in parts of Shanghai. New subvariants of the virus are proving a constant challenge to the country's zero tolerance approach. And those shares of Twitter are falling. The company is preparing to go to court to force Elon Musk to follow through with his commitment to buy it for $44 billion. Bloomberg's learned that a filing in the Delaware Court of Chancery could happen as soon as today. The court has rarely sided with parties who, like Musk, are attempting to bail on acquisition commitments. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy. Rudika, thank you very much indeed. Let's pick up on that last point. Elon Musk dodging Twitter questions when he spoke at Sun Valley over the weekend. Ed Ludlow was certainly listening. He was there. He's back for us now. He's here to give us a bit more analysis on what is going on with this Twitter story. Ed, as we head to court, who has the upper hand? Yeah, it's interesting because what Elon Musk has to prove is that the issue over bots in that he argues that Twitter was not forthcoming and did not respond to his multiple requests for information for bots um, equates to a material adverse effect. That is very codified in the original April agreement between the two parties, what a material adverse effect would look like. But it basically means that it was so significant that it impacted the, the company's fundamentals. And if you look at past precedent, in, in disputes of this type, I think there's just one or very few cases where a judge has found in favor of material adverse effects. So, you know, I, guys, you and I have been discussing, you know, people have been telling me for a week now that they thought about buying Twitter stock. They thought about trying to get in touch with Musk about participating in the deal, but they hold, held off because they thought that a legal battle was coming anyway. And, you know, I think we've been braced for this for some time. And Ed, that's what I want to dig into because you were doing some absolutely fantastic reporting out at Sun Valley. And in the conversations that you were having yeah. with investors, I mean, what was the mood music on this deal? Would they come in after the legal battle? What was the overall vibe? Yeah, it's that Musk was volatile. And when they sat down and thought about what they wanted to do, they just thought it wasn't worth it. You know, the behavior is so interesting. He, in the room at Sun Valley, sources tell me who are, who are listening to him speak, he was very clear. He declined to answer questions about the deal itself. He, he said, you know, generally he felt Twitter needed to be more transparent about its user data and its algorithms, but resisted the urge to comment on the deal. Fast forward 36 hours, he's tweeting a meme about himself. I'm not going to read it verbatim, but just go on his Twitter account saying, you know, they said I couldn't buy Twitter. He asked for information on bots. Twitter is suing Musk and now Musk says that Twitter is going to have to hand over this information on bots anyway. So, you know, it's a very volatile situation. I think there is a feeling that this will be settled out of court potentially. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the question I've always had is why did he go through with this anyway in the first place? Um, but watch this space. Filing could come today. Settled out of court means he buys it for, for a lower price, right? Yeah, I think, I think the consensus has been, if you look at the spread, the merger arbs, you talk to investors, you talk to M&A experts, haven't we always been moving towards a position where he comes in at a lower price? You know, Twitter's stock has been somewhat immune to the, the pain in public market or tech shares this year because it was subject to a bid. And any investor would have bitten off your hand at $54.20 a share. A lot of people I speak to say maybe he'll come back in lower. But the bots issue remains. And that's what's so strange about all of this. Twitter has always said that bots are less than 5% of users on the platform. It's standard boilerplate language and has been for some time. He waived due diligence, Elon Musk did in April when he signed the agreement. And that's always been something that's not made any sense to a lot of people. So, Ed, is there a possibility that someone not named Elon Musk could come in here and make a bid on Twitter? I think that would be complicated. You have to be pretty brave to make that decision. I think the interesting piece of reporting that we kind of forget so quickly about is that, according to the Washington Post, Elon Musk stopped speaking to potential equity partners last week. But as of that point, 
there were lots of names across the world of private capital, strategic investors, Silicon Valley names that Musk is associated with who were participating in a deal. What about all those people who are now sort of subject to Musk's decision to terminate the merger agreement? And then I guess the other one is, you know, Twitter's role in all of this. You know, they want to fight this, but a protracted legal battle, you know, mm -hmm. people I speak to say this could go up to 10 years in, in a worst case scenario. Financially, this is very difficult. 10 years, that would be fun. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, that'll keep you busy. Thank you so much for your time, yeah. just doing fantastic work out there. And for more on Twitter, we're going to welcome Angelo Zeno. He is senior equity analyst at CFRA Research. He cut his 12-month price target on Twitter to $33 from $44, and he has a hold rating on the stock. Angelo, great to have some time with you. After this news on Friday, you saw Dan Ives from Wedbush say that Musk terminating the deal was a, quote, disaster scenario for Twitter. Would you go as far as to say that? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, it's definitely not a good situation at the end of the day here. I mean, we did, to your point, we did cut our target price to $33. Um, at the end of the day, really, we, we peg about an 80% probability that Twitter now remains public. And um, on a standalone base, basis, we do value the company at $26 a share. But when you kind of look at the company here, if they were to uh, were forced to operate on a standalone basis here, um, there are just, just so many headwinds kind of going against them here, whether it be an uncertain advertising market, right, whether it be kind of an, an, a damaged employee base here, or whether it be kind of the kind of the, the opening of Pandora's box in many respects for, by Elon Musk in terms of the fake accounts and, and even the strategic direction of the company yep. here um, on a going forward basis. Angelo, if that is the case, what, what does the Elon Musk exit look like? What do you think it costs him? I think that's kind of, I think that's the, the main question out there, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, we do think kind of Twitter ha is on a much better footing kind of going into the courts here. And um, that being said, we do think they stand to receive some sort of um, compensation from Musk. Um, again, the question is how much. We do think at, at the minimum they get the $1 billion. But ultimately, the actual valuation of this company is going to uh, highly depend on how much he gets at the end of the day, which is why we have our $33 target well above the $26 uh, target you know, on a standalone basis. And Angelo, I want to ask you the same question that I ask Ed. I mean, is there any chance that someone else comes in here and tries to make a run at Twitter? You know, I, we told investors we think we don't see any other potential interested bidder or white knight out there for Twitter, at, at least at these current levels. Um, and, and given some of the, the nightmarish conditions that they're going to have to deal with here, at least over the next two to three quarters, I think, you know, at the end of the day, Twitter does have value, right? There is value within yeah. that kind of ecosystem there. But it, it all remains kind of how low can this stock go? And if it kind of gets to extremely depressed levels, could there potentially be a better out there? Potentially, but not at these levels in our view. What is your sense of what's happening within the firm right now? As you say, morale pretty low. How low? Uh, we think extremely low. Um, in, in terms of kind of what Elon, I, I, we think at the end of the day there, were, there was definitely some mixed views um, in terms of the kind of the employee base out there. I think there were some out there that probably wanted to give Elon Musk a chance, kind of get a fresh start there. Um, some new ideas within the Twitter um, ecosystem. And then there are others out there that, that kind of the last thing they wanted to see was kind of must take over and, you know, be part of the circus involved there. But um, as far as kind of the, the morale there right now, we think it's extremely depressed, not to mention not only with what's going on with Elon Musk, but mm -hmm. also, you know, the, the underlying kind of ad market and, you know, the macro conditions going on right now. And Angelo, you cut your price target, but you still have a hold rating on the stock. What would you need to see that would bump you up to a buy? Uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, we would have to see. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything, to be honest with you, that would kind of get us towards a buy at these levels. And um, a lot of that really has to do with the valuation out there. Um, but if investors were to kind of somehow see a higher level than where we're sitting here today, um, you know, it would largely have to it would almost almost entirely be dependent on what actually takes place um, in the courts. If we continue to see uh, positive developments in favor of Twitter um, over the next couple of months and quarters, I think that's where you kind of get um, some momentum in the stock price.
Wow. Angelo, thank you very much indeed. Angelo Zeno, yeah. CFRA, Senior Equity Strategist on what's happening with Twitter. Thank you very much indeed, sir. This is Bloomberg. Thirty-five minutes to go until the European close. Now, not all red is negative, but when it comes to Europe, most of it is. Let's talk about what we see on the screen here. Stock 600 down by around half of 1% today. Miners in particular are down. You've got the Chinese story filtering through into the commodity market, then fil filtering through uh, into the mining stocks. So names like Rio and BHP tracking lower today, certainly bringing up the rear uh, when it comes to the European equity performance. So 415 is where we're trading. This is the, the, the main event. Actually, I think this is the main event. But the euro uh, just below 101 uh, right now. 1007 is the kind of the recent low area. Most people seem to think that actually we're heading well below parity. And the reason we're heading below parity is because of what is happening here. Dutch natural gas today coming lower. The Canadians are going to hand over a Siemens turbine back to the Germans who are then going to hand it to Gazprom. This relates to the maintenance on Nord Stream 1, which is shut down today. Will it be turned back on again? That's the big question that we're watching. We've got a lot of things, other things we need to be watching as well. What is happening with the City of London? What's happening with UK politics? Vincent Keevney, Lord Mayor of the City of London, joining us next to discuss what the City of London wants. This is Bloomberg.